to be seated. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before your presence today, we come to you and we bow before you and we worship you because you are the only God. You're not the greatest God, you're the only God. You are real, you are powerful, you are our creator. We have been designed by you. So therefore, we owe you worship. So we come here today, as we take time from a hectic life, and we come together as your people to worship you. Accept our worship. Accept our songs as an offering to you. And as we open the word and we study it, Lord, please speak to us. I ask you, Lord, as your servant, as I stand before your people, that your Holy Spirit may translate my words according to the needs of each person that is here today. That their needs may be fulfilled, that you may speak to them, and that they may leave this place here knowing that they have been with you. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 We'd like to let all of you know that today uh, after the service we have lunch. So if you want to stay and just fellowship for a while with us, you're invited to, to be here. Just fellowship. We have a very good lunch. It'll be worth it. And at the same time, we can get to know each other a little bit better. I would like for you to open your Bibles to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 15. Luke cha chapter 15. If you notice that we, uh, in this church, we are not passing the plate or collecting an offering, but we give you an envelope in case you want to put uh, something in that envelope to support the ministry. Or on your way out, you can, we have uh, one. As you go out, we have places where you can put them in. Or if you just want to give an offering, even though if it's not in the envelope, we will, we will sac make a sacrifice and still take it. And uh, if you want to just put something in there, we would appreciate it. We, we are trying to get out of the habit of uh, passing the plate. We want only those that feel that they're grateful and feel that what's being done here is worthwhile and that you want to be able to give and donate to the ministry. We want you to be able to do that and give you the opportunity to do that at any time or on your way out as we have uh, the offering boxes there for you to be able to, to donate. And we thank you for anything that you can do. A while back, I was at a church and uh, it was a Friday night. We call it an AY Adventist Youth uh, Meeting. And as I was there, uh, the, the youth praise team, were beginning to get ready to, to go up and lead in praise. And as they were leading in praise, all of a sudden, there was a big commotion because someone had showed up to church. A young man who had showed up to church, this young man had left church, had not, they had not seen him for a long time. And they finally, they, they see him walk in, maybe six, seven years later. He had been away from church, so all the kids who grew up with him, that were on that praise team, they saw him, they were so excited to see him. And, and when he walked in, they all went out and they hugged him, they were glad to see him. They were ready to go up and, and they knew that this young man could actually sing. So the, the youth in church, they were so excited about that that they, that they went up and they, they asked him, they said, can you, can you come up and sing with us? I mean, this guy hadn't been to church in five or six years. His father was there in church that night. He surprised his father. His father was so excited to see his son in church. And as they asked him to, to sing, he said, yeah. So these young people, you know, with the, with the desire that youth to have, uh, sometimes they don't think a lot about consequences, and, and, and they took the young man and they went up and he sang with them in the praise team. Now there was something interesting about this young man, that as he, as he, as he sang, 
He had a he had a tongue ring. So as he sang, and the lights were on him, the ring, you know, just shine right out of his mouth. We sang with him, and it was great. It was beautiful. The, the father was crying. The father was excited to see his son sing. And, but as AY was over, and people were leaving, and I went into the office, I had four or five elders there waiting for me. Gosh, what are we coming to? Did you see what that young man had? I mean, are we forgetting about the principles of the church? And they began to go on and on. Now these were men who had seen this child grow up in church. He finally comes back. They didn't even go over to say hi to a hug and say, hey, welcome back. They went straight to the office and said, hey, we got to straighten this out. And I sat there and I listened to them. And I said, I can see how you feel. Now let me ask you this. Have you gone and asked his father how he feels? How do you think his father feels? I said, uh, oh, he, he must be happy. I said, why? Why is he happy? And you're upset. What is the difference? The difference is love. That's the difference. That that father's love, seeing his son out there, the last thing he saw was that tongue ring. He was just excited to see his son in church. I said, that was the difference. One of the problems that we have in Christianity today is that we call ourselves as followers of someone that we don't imitate. We call ourselves followers of Christ, but for the Christian church to be consistent, the Christian church must be consistent in how we do things how we save people, how we treat people. We must be consistent with how Jesus treated people. There must be consistency there. We can't have all these church rules that did not apply to Christ and then call ourselves Christians. The only way we can call ourselves Christians is if we follow the same principles and rules that Jesus followed. But then people say, well, what are we going to come to then? That's not your business. Have you heard that Christianity is not about you? This is God. He's the one who leads it, not you. He has the power to transform and change anybody. In the book of Luke, chapter 15, we're starting today a series of five sermons on the story of the, of the, par on the parable of the prodigal son. I have preached before on the, par on the parable of the prodigal part of the son. And as I have preached about this, I've tried to do the whole, the whole parable. And I've decided it's so powerful, it's so deep, I want to do a whole series on it. And this series is called From Riches to Rags. From riches to rags. Yet the story of the prodigal son, if we go to the book of Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son is not really the story of the prodigal son. The person at the center of the story is not the prodigal son. It is actually the story about a good father. It's really about the father. It's really about two disobedient sons. One who was close and one who was far. But for us to really understand the story, we must see the context in which Jesus 
So, so today, we're not going to go over the whole story. We're just going to go over the first part of the story. But we first, it's important for us to understand the context in which Jesus tells this story. And the context in which Jesus tells the story, if you look at chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, says that all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. Who drew near to Jesus? Who? Tax collectors and what? All the said all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to Jesus. So the tax collectors, now the tax collectors, they were uh, they were called also publicans, uh, not republicans, but publicans, okay? And they and, and they actually were, were were looked at by the people of other time as as those who betrayed the Jewish nation because they were Jews working for the Romans, collecting taxes for the Romans from the Jews. So the Jews hated them. They were big money and, and, the, and, the, and the, the Romans used to give them a cut or whatever they collected. So they had a lot of money and they just betrayed their people for money. So they were looked at as sinners and the Jews didn't like them very much. And then uh, the other people that used to follow Jesus, prostitutes, sinners, and things like that, and that, that sort of people. Those sort of people, I like it says, it says the tax collectors and, and sinners drew near to him. They were drawn by Jesus. Isn't that incredible? They were drawn by Jesus. And as they were drawn by Jesus, it says the Pharisees and scribes, Complained who were the Pharisees and scribes. Though they were the religious people. The religious people. The Pharisees, we've talked about them and a couple of times we've, uh, uh, we've preached. They were very religious. The Pharisees called separated, the separated ones. They, they separated themselves from people. Have you seen those type of Christians? How they separate themselves from other people. You know, they go to a, another place and they will grab their Bible, and then as others are talking about other things, they'll sit in the corner and read your Bible, make sure everybody can see. You know, and they separate themselves from, uh, from others. If you notice that Jesus never separated himself with people, he always went where people were. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were another, uh, uh, another sect of the Jewish nation, but they were a higher class. They had more money. The Pharisees were usually poor people who were, who were they, they, they did things to, to be more humble, to be more holy. While the Sadducees had, had a lot of money, they had more, more power. Uh, but this, but there were the, the two religious sects. And they criticized Jesus, and the Pharisees and scribes, and scribes complained. You know, here is Jesus who claimed to be the Son of God. Here is Jesus who was so perfect. Here is Jesus who had all these things. And they were confused because the Pharisees were used to, because they were so holy, they were used to separating themselves from people. And here Jesus says he's the son of God without sin, and he's actually mixing himself with people. So they couldn't understand that. So this man, so they, they said that scribes and Pharisees saying this man receives sinners, and he actually eats with them. That's the environment, that's the context, and we just, Jesus comes and tells this parable. The question is, how can such a holy God, how can a being that is so holy actually have something to do with sinners? Why wouldn't he just separate himself from them instead of being with them? It is interesting that the sinners felt comfortable around Jesus and the most religious felt uncomfortable around Jesus. It, it, you, you have to study this, people. You have to look at this attitude of Jesus. You have to see this so that, so that the church can then emulate that. Emulate that. Because then we're not Christians. It's dangerous to emulate that because we as human beings, we want to establish rules and regulations because we like to control things. And we like to set these rules, bam, bam, one, two, three, you know, Roman number one, two, A, B, C, and we like to do things like that. And with God, sometimes it doesn't work that way. You know why? Because God can do whatever he wants. 
And people try to put God in a box. Let me tell you, the worst thing you can try to do is put God in a box. Just try to say, no, God, no, God wouldn't. People say, God wouldn't do that. God would only do this. And lo, you get ready to be surprised. So Jesus tells three parables. He tells two parables before the parable of the prodigal son. The first one is, what man of you, verse 4, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? In other words, he said, you're asking me why I would come down from heaven and spend time with these so-called sinners. Yet you, if you have a hundred sheep and one gets lost, you leave the 99 and you chase the 99. The other one, see, he was telling them what they normally did as Jews, as people. And he's trying to say, you're asking me why I go after sinners, why I sit with the prostitutes, with the publicans, and I, and I, and I talk to them. But you, you go after these little sheep and you, and you search all night for this little one sheep. And he's trying to say, that's exactly how I feel about people. If you are willing to search all night, if you are willing to search all night for little sheep, why wouldn't I? This is the kind of spirit of saying that the church is set up. As is Christian. And then he tells them another little story about, about a woman who lost, who loses money. Have any of you ever lost money? You know it's in the house. Right? It didn't leave the house. I know it's here. You know you lose two or three hundred bucks. I know I put it. And some of you can't sleep. And you wake up in the middle of the morning, in the middle of the night, to look for that. I know it's got to be. And the parable says the woman looked and she cleaned the whole house. She said that when she found it, she was so excited, she called all of her friends and told them, I found it, I found it. There was rejoice. Jesus said, there's more rejoicement in heaven. There's rejoicement in heaven when one sinner comes to repentance. And Jesus is trying to tell them in the same way that you get excited about things. About things. About your sheep. About money that you look for and then you find. In the same way, I get excited about people. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what they've come through, what they what they've gone through. See, when, when we are when we are parents, we experience what God experiences in a, in, in, in a little way that when, that we, when we have good we have good kids. We have kids who are really obedient, do things. We have kids who rebel. We're, and and we actually end up those kids who rebel. We end up like. Chasing them and loving them more because we it doesn't matter what they do, we just go after them. We love them. So Jesus comes to the story. Then he finally comes to a father with two sons. In chapter, in verse eleven, chapter fifteen, verse eleven. Then he said that a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to, to be in one. 
Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that he the swine ate. No one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw, saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to him, Servant, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put, him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf, calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. But for this my son was dead and is alive, and he was lost and is found. And they began to be married. See, then in this story, the son comes, the father has two sons, and the younger one comes and tells the father, Father, this man was a very rich man, had a big business, money was coming in consistently, and he had uh, his will all fixed up. He put a will together and let his sons know what each of them were going to have. But the younger one couldn't wait. His father, you know, he was old, but he was helping. So the young son, you know, he saw all the money he could inherit, and he said, you know what, this is, he said, you know, bro, you're not dying, man. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in my 20s here. I want to enjoy life. I want to do what I want to do, and you're not dying. You know, really, when you study this and you go back to the culture, the most disrespectful thing that a young man could do was that. To ask his father for, for his, his inheritance before his father died. Because really, he was telling him, I want you to die. Finally, the son says, you know, Father, I want my part. I want my part. I want my part. I want to go somewhere. Leaving doesn't happen from one day to the next. Leaving the church, leaving God, is something that doesn't happen from one day to the next. It's just like in a marriage. No one gets divorced from one day to the next. They usually spend years divorced mentally before they're actually physically divorced. And your spiritual life is the same thing. People get away from reading the Bible, people get away from praying, and they begin to try to live Christianity on their own efforts, knowledge, and abilities, and it's just a lifestyle. And they think that they can do it. Because after all, they're pretty good people, and they try to do that. All of a sudden, temptations come in, and they're not ready to handle that. And not only temptations, but pretty soon, they used to like church, they used to like this. Now they begin to dislike things that are of God, and they begin to like things that are of the world. And those things that are of the world become to take hold of the person. And this young man, for many months, for many years, he had been playing with things. He had been, he, he had left the relationship with his father. He was not spending time with his father. He was spending more time with other things. And he began to, to see that other things were more important than what the father could actually offer him. He rejected the authority of the father. He wanted to own himself. Thinking that by doing what he wanted, he would get freedom. See, people say, I want to, I want to be free. Why, why should I go to a church and get tied down? Why should I serve God? I want to be free. I want to do what I want to do. I want to control my own life. Imagine your four-year-old or five-year-old telling you that. Imagine a 
four or five year old coming and telling you, I want to control my own life. I want to do what I want. I want to tell you something that that's exactly what you sound like to God. When you think I don't need to be under the authority of God, I don't need to be under the authority of the Bible, I don't need to be under the authority of anything. I can control, I can decide, I have control of my own life. You sound just as, as dumb as your little four-year-old or five-year-old telling you that they want to control their own life. And he came to the Father and just said to the Father, He should have noticed that under the authority of his father, he had an inheritance. See? Under the authority of the father, he had an inheritance. He had money, he had comfort, he had authority, and a future. He took all that he put at the feet, everything that the father had given him, and he put it at the feet of Satan. See, you're going to be under somebody's authority no matter what. You can choose to be under the authority of God. And you can choose to, or you can choose to be under the authority of Satan. The problem is that sometimes people say, well, under the authority of Satan means that the guy is possessed. No. Devil, he's, he's not dumb. He's very smart. You know, he... He doesn't care if you live a good life. The devil is okay with you living a regular good life. In fact, he's probably okay with you coming to church. That's all right with him. You can go to church, enjoy the service and all that stuff, but don't give your life over to God. Do stuff that make you feel good. Do stuff that make you feel religious. But don't give your life to God. See, the devil is okay. He's not going to be, you're not going to be wild. You're not going to be crazy. It doesn't mean you give yourself the devil. You're going to be on drugs. And you're going to be, no, no. In fact, his way is to keeping you saying, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. Life is good. See, I don't go to church. I don't give my life to God. Look at me. I don't know anything. way he wants to keep you. Because you see, if things get really, really bad, then you start wanting to go back to church, right? When things get really bad, hey, can somebody please pray for me? I'm going to go to church. So, this young man, he got tired of being under the authority of God, under the authority of the Father, and we sometimes do that. We, 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 we want to get out of the authority of God. And this young man said, I want to go. And he began to, to, to want the things that he wanted. He began to want the things of the world. And the things of the world became more important to him. You see, this, this father, it's like well, when, when I think about this story, he said, Father, give me my portion. When I think of that, I think of the father having like a well. You see, if you have a well, you never run out of water because there's a river flowing under that well. And water constantly keeps coming up. And the father was never going to run out of wealth because he had a big business and money was always there. Now when the son says, give me my part, it's like sticking a bucket down in that well, taking out the water and saying, here son, here's your part. What's the problem with that? That the water in the bucket, when it runs out, you're done. You're done. But at the father's house, there was a well, but the water would never run out. See, when you are with God, his blessings never run out. And because you were raised in the church or because you know about God, because you have done certain things right, God has given you blessings. And the blessings that you have are the things that are now making you successful in this world. Well, now you go out there 
you go to a job, you go anywhere, and people say, wow, you're, I mean, I love you, can we pay you more? And, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, people treat you right because, you know why? Because of the principles and the teachings that your parents taught you as a youth. That has made your character, has made you who you are, and it has, it's made you attractive to the world. It has made you different. And all of a sudden, you get begin to say, man, I can make some big money now. I don't need to be in church. And like the son, you say, give me my stuff and let me take it somewhere else. It wasn't his. It was the father. There's so many of you. So many of us spending what God has given you out there. Dedicating it to your own good and not seeing God in the picture. And not involving God in your life. And you're not recognizing that everything that you have, you have because he has given it to you. Because at one point or another, through somebody, he put his principles within you, and you are living that, and that's why you are attractive to the world. But the day you become just like them, you're useless. You become useless. We'll get that to that in the next one. Matthew 16, 26 says, For what profit is a man if he gains the whole world and loses what? His own soul. What will a man give to exchange his soul? You see, home in this parable, leaving home is leaving the teachings that you learn, is leaving the principles that you've learned with God, is leaving the things that God has taught you to live on how to do, even leaving the traditions, even leaving, leaving home means leaving everything that you have learned, everything that God has taught you, everything that your parents have taught you. As you go back, young people, as you grow up, and you begin to have children of your own, you begin to remember the things that your parents taught you, and now you begin to see how important they are. You begin to see, but when you leave home, you leave tradition, you leave things. I, I mean, I mean, I look back and, 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 and I remember, you know, in my family, every Friday night, you know, just getting together and worship, you know, with something we practice our whole life. Every Friday night, getting together and having vespers together. See, those things, that, that's part of home. And, and we leave those things. And, and we call that's tradition. Oh, that's dumb. Or oh, that's this. Or oh, the way the Sabbath was kept. And we say, well, we don't have to do that anymore. And we leave home. We leave those things that represent home. The things that represent us. And as we leave those things, we begin later on to see how much they hurt us and hurt our children also now. The young man said, I don't want any part with that. I want to go live my own life. There's a book called The Return of the Particle Son by Henry J.M. Newman. I recommend you get that book, Henry J.M. Newman, and he knew it. And he said that it's leaving home is then much more than a historical event bound to time and place. It is a denial of the spiritual reality that I belong to God with every part of my being, that God holds me safe in an eternal embrace, that I am indeed carved in the palms of God's hands and hidden in their shadows. Leaving home means ignoring the truth that God has fashioned me in secret, molded me in the depths of the earth, and knitted me together in my mother's womb. Leaving home is leaving living it is living as though I do not yet have a home. And must look far and wide to find one. You have a home. 
you know what home that is. You have a home. A home that you've been taught as a child. A home that you have earned in scriptures. If you're there, thank God for it, enjoy it, and live in it. Don't be looking out the window trying to see if there's something better out there. Enjoy it. Live like a Christian. Let God lead your life. Let Him fill your life. He is your creator. He knows what makes you enjoy life. God is our creator. If you say, well, God doesn't exist. God is not our creator. God is that. Then you're saying that you're nothing. That's what you're saying. I'm nothing. I'm just a big accident. I don't know. Are you a big accident? Are you a big man? People that tell me that's almost like me going out there and saying, you see that car out there? That car just happened. <coughs> oh, who made that car? Who made it? Nobody made it. It just happened, bro. It just happened. Oh, come on. How can something working so perfect in this car, how can they, they, they have someone had to have built this car? No, man, it just happened. That's about as dumb as you telling me that human beings, we have no designer behind us. That we have no designer that actually the, the reason why the liver and the heart and the bladder and all these things work in the same way, that there was a designer behind it. And believe me, your body and my body are more complex than any car, than any computer out there. And yet for us to believe that a computer or a car had no one designed it, it just happened, it's stupid. How could you say now that we as human beings, we, we just happened, man? There was no plan, there was no design. For you to leave home to say, I want to live on my own, just means you are rejecting a creator. You are rejecting that there is a plan for your life. This young man did not know his father had a plan for his life. He had a plan for him to accomplish certain things. And so do you and so do I. God has a plan for you. There is a designer and, there is, and he has designed you and me for a purpose. And he's brought us into this world. It doesn't matter under which situation he's brought you into this world. He has a plan for you. Don't leave home. Because that's where the plan happens. That's where you reach your purpose. That's where you carry it out. And if you've left home, come on back. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. Today, Jesus represents his Father. And we have to understand that we are created with a plan. I could imagine that Father's plan that he had for his son just be destroyed before his eyes. His father said, I want to leave home. I want to live on my own. Give me my money. I'll see you later. I can imagine that loving father seeing his son walk away. And he probably stood there until he just couldn't see him anymore. And that father in the story, every day he would come out That's how God is. If you want to walk away, God won't hold you back. You say, go ahead. Some people have to, hit, have, have to hit their head up against the wall before they know if that's the wrong way. When you wake up in the morning and the bed is up against the wall, and you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, you know that you got to roll over the other way. Now the question is, how many times are you going to hit your head on the wall before you realize that you've got to go the other way? And the son he went there and he decided that he wanted to leave. 
that he wanted to leave because there was a better way than living. living. There's a story of a, of a ship. And it was night and it was a big storm. And that ship, as it was in the ocean, it looked and it saw a light. And when they saw that light, they saw that, that ship saw that it was heading straight for the light. And one of the sailors told the captain, Captain, I think that's another ship. We're heading straight for it. And he said, listen, call him on the radio and tell him to move 24 degrees to the left. Because if not, we're going to hit him. Tell him to move. Radio came back and said, no, you move. He said, listen, tell him that I said that I am the captain. They, they must move to the left. 24 degrees. Answer back and said, I'm sorry, it's impossible. You must move. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here today. We thank you because you give us the opportunity to be your sons and daughters. I ask you, Lord, that today you may help us to enjoy being home. Let us enjoy Christianity, everything that you have for us, the way you want us to. Help us, Lord, to love you more and more in each day. Help us to come to know you more. And Lord, there are some that are on their way back home right now. They're tired of living out there in the world. They've been lost. They've tried it. They've gone out and they've seen everything. And they've seen how much they're wasting their time, how empty everything is. We want your inheritance. You are our father. Let us come back for your inheritance. 